Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to our read-through of The Hero of Kendrickstone. Chapter 3, Rogues and Wizards. Dame Mildred parts ways with you as the two of you walk through Kendrickstone's massive gates. Remember, she says as she begins to ride away, if you ever wish to enter into my service, come to the keep at any time. I'll have it arranged. I don't remember her voice. Sorry about that. With that, the knight who may have saved your life is gone, disappearing into the massive throng of people who mingle and surge and crowd the narrow, well-trodden city streets, even at this late hour. The senses of the city overwhelm you from every direction. First there is the noise, the cacophony of thousands or hundreds of people, merchants hawking their wares, a hundred different conversations, the cries of animals and children, the rattle of carts, and a hundred other noises. It is all the bubbling babble of a village meeting magnified a thousandfold. Then there are the smells, the sweat and stink of thousands of unwashed bodies, the miasma left by the piss and sh shit of human and animal both, Jeez, the stench of rotting food, smoke and cooking grease, and other foul order odors you cannot even recognize. The air is thick with droppings and cast-offs, cast the rotting byproducts of tens of thousands of lives. Holy crap. This is a shitty city. Finally, your ears get used to the cacophony, and your nose begins to filter the overpowering stench, and you can see the glory that is Kendrickstone. Houses piled three or four stories high, stretching into the distance like a jumbled mass, the high, thick walls cordoning themselves from the outside world. To one side stands an immense human-raised mountain of spires and turrets and crenellated bulk wards in bloodstone red. The city's keep, where the Duke of Kendrickstone rules over the surveys. All he surveys, pardon me. To the other side, a strange construction overlooks the city. What looks like two towers, one upended and hovering in midair above the other. Either that's a wizard's tower, or you're the Manza of Coralandis. With the day drawing to a close, you need to quickly decide where to go. Hmm. Yeah, we're a free woman. We're, we're all going to find an inn to stay at. We still have like 30-something silver. I mean, going to the wizard's tower would be cool, but we're not a magician. You head into the winding maze of narrow roads, some cobbled, some nothing more than a thick layer of dirt, rainwater, and other materials you really don't want to think about. With no particularly particular direction in mind, you wander the city streets looking for an inn or other accommodation. Alas, in the twisting roads of the great city and encroaching gloom of night, you find yourself hopelessly lost. Before long, you have no idea at all where you are. You've never been in a big city like Kendrickstone, and the gloom of night, coupled with the shadowy silhouettes of the bu uh, buildings around you, have left you completely disoriented. Worse yet, the throngs of people who were crowded the streets not long ago have retreated into their homes. You're practically alone. Practically, but not quite. You turn yet another corning, corner in the evening gloom, only to find yourself face to face with a pug-faced man in a stout leather jack, a truncheon in one hand, and a lit torch in the other. You there, he demands. Where are your papers, girl? Uh, we're clever, but... Let's just be truthful. We can talk our way out of it. Papers? What papers? You sputter. What are you talking about? The man with the truncheon steps closer. Your writ of protection, you stupid girl. Where is it? He snarls. A writ of protection? You have no idea what that could possibly mean. I don't know what you're talking about, you protest. Well, that's a real shame, a wisp uh, whispers a voice from behind you as the cold steel of a sharp blade presses against your throat. The man with your, the man with the truncheon whistles two notes, sharp and loud in the evening gloom. Another dozen men and women step out of the shadows, seemingly from every alleyway, alleyway and alcove. Some carry daggers, some clubs. Three hold steel bowed ar arbalests, capable of punching holes through steel plate. Great. Being out alone, I'm not sure which one this is. Oh, this. Being out alone with 
At night, without a wit of protection. You should know better. The man with the truncheon snarls. You should know what that means. You spend a moment completely confused, since you very obviously don't. The thug with the truncheon growls in frustration. Hand over your money and weapons, you stupid idiot, he snarls. We'll leave you your clothes on the back as a courtesy, but next time we find you out with no writ, we'll just slit your throat and be done with it. Have done with you. How wonderful. For the second time today, somebody's trying to rob you. The situation looks grim indeed. You're in an unfamiliar city, alone, at night, and surrounded by a dozen heavily armed robbers. What now? Jesus. Okay. We're going to try and talk them out of it again. <laughs> there must be some way you can convince these people you're not someone they want to rob. Perhaps you can pretend you are the child of a powerful noble? No, your clothes aren't fine enough. The old standby of a pretending to be wizard in a harmless guise? That may have to do. You open your mouth to speak. What's all this then? All around you, the thugs seem to freeze up at the sound of a reedy but authoritative voice. A man steps out from the shadows. Not another thug, but a thin, balding man of middle years, dark hair pulled back and com complemented by a neatly trimmed beard. He wears a bright blue doublet, black hose, and the draped chap chaperon of a wealthy merchant. Let that girl go, he orders. Surprisingly enough, the knife disappears from your neck. You can't help but stare in puzzlement. A wealthy merchant, alone at night and unarmed? These thugs should be robbing him, not taking orders from him. Boss, this one's fair game, the man in the trench the man in the trench yawn protests. No writ of protection or anything. Of course the girl has no writ, you stupid dolt, the man in the blue doublet replies peevishly. She's just come into town. Janet's group watched this one walk through the gate not an hour ago. The merchant walks up to the thug, you, as all the thugs lower their weapon. Look, I'm quite sorry about this mess, he says to you. That doesn't even come close to answering any of your questions. In fact, it may have raised a few more. Let's just ask what a writ of protection is, and then hopefully we get a chance to ask where we are. A writ of protection, the merchant replies. Why, it's one of these, of course. He reaches into one of his many pouches at his belt and pulls out a small roll of tough, expensive-looking vellum tied with a string of red yarn. The merchant unfolds the scroll with a practiced movement, and then produces a bottle of ink and a sharpened reed, the kind used for writing, from the other pouch. He unstoppers the ink, dips in the reed in the ink, and scribbles something onto the scroll. This scroll is three months' worth of protection, he says as he offers it to you. It will ward you from three thieves and other criminals. If you are ever accosted within the city walls by a thug or brigand, simply show this to them, and they'll leave you be. You take the scroll, and the merchant continues. Normally, a writ like this would cost you fifty silver. However, as an apology for your rough treatment, I offer you this one for free. You will, of course, have to buy another at the end of the three-month period. Uh, okay, so he's the godfather? We're giving him insurance money, basically? The well-dressed man dips his head in a polished, fluid courtier's bow. William of Hollowford, at your service. And you? I am Isabel, you reply, from Forester's Hollow. The merchant's eyebrows rise. Ah, so you are new here. Well, in that case, allow me to offer you some advice. These fine men and women, he gestures to the heavily armed thugs surrounding you, answer to me. Should any of them continue to trouble you in any way, do not hesitate to come to me, and I shall see your case readdressed. We have a very large man's in Brightwall Quarter. It's very easy to find. Your eyes widen. Who is this man, and exactly how did he obtain the immense power and wealth he seems to wield with such familiarity? William of Hol Holloford smiles. These folks are my worker, you see. I am a merchant. I trade in protection. To be more specifically, I ensure that no man, woman, or child under my protection in this city is threatened by pickpockets, burglars, or murderers. You return the merchant's look pointedly, remembering the feelings of sharp steel against your throat. That's funny, you say, your voice dripping with irony, because I could, I could swear your workers were about to rob me. The merchant replies with the shake of a head and an easy smile. 
You must understand, dear girl, I run a business. I generally find it good policy if those unwilling to pay for protection are reminded of why that might be inadvisable. Uh, I think we'll, uh, I'm, I'm tempted to, yeah, we're gonna, it's a pretty clever way to do business. William of Holliford responds with a wide, honest-looking grin, revealing teeth in remarkably good condition for someone his age. I'm glad you think so, my young friend. I am very glad to think that, very glad that you think so. Alright, let's figure out where the hell we are. The man with the trungeon rolls his eyes. One of the thugs behind him actually sheathes her dagger to bury her face in the palm of her hand. You're in the Warrens, my friend, the merchant replies. It's the poorest part of town, and the easiest one to get lost in. Few people who don't live here ever come in here, and none by choice. Suddenly, you feel very, very small. The shadows of these houses around you seem to loom even larger than you, as if to blot out the evening sky. I very much hope, the merchant continues, that you didn't come by here by choice, my friend. You shake your head nervously. No, I didn't. I guess I was pretty lucky to run into you, wasn't I? There are certainly worse scenarios running through your head. The merchant looks at you oddly for a moment, then smiles. Lucky? Yes, I suppose you might think of it that. William of Hollowfield peers up at the sky for a moment, then looks back down. Regardless, it's best you'd be getting out of here. I mean no offense to the fine folk who live here, but the Warrens after dark can be an unpleasant place, especially if you're not used to the big city. I suppose you will need directions? It looks like it doesn't matter what direction we went, we were going to get lost no matter what. And once again, we're going to try and find that freaking inn. I'm just looking for an inn, you reply. I need somewhere to stay while I find work. The merchant thinks for a moment. I know a good place, he says. The owner's fair, and the rates are cheap. The rooms are, rooms are clean as such places go, and the food isn't too bad. That sounds like as good a recommendation as any. How might I find the place? William of Hollowfield, Hollowford takes you by the shoulder and turns you towards one of the dark alleys. Take that road down until it splits in two. From there, turn right until you get to the river. Then, walk past the bridge until you see the sign of a flaming sword. That's the place. The Blazing Sword Inn. You go over his instructions in your mind until you're sure you understand them. Then, you nod. Well, let's thank him and be on our way. Thank you for the directions, you reply. I should probably get going. However, before you turn to leave, the man in blue speaks again. Hold a moment, he says. You stop. Now that I think about it, someone like you might be of great use to me, he says. You're young, fit, and fresh from the country. I could offer you a bed, meals, and even a little bit of pay in exchange for a few... services. Well, oh, hey, what kind of services are you talking about? You've heard the cautionary tales of bright-eyed youth coming into the city, being taken in by the unscrupulous and the immoral, and being forced into disreputable trades you certainly want no part in. William of Hollowford recoils for half a moment, an expression of shock on his face. Not the sort you're thinking of, not at all. I need a courier, someone capable of running messages and delivering the occasional warning or two. Nothing illegal. And certainly nothing unsavory. You know, the fact that you had to say nothing illegal is... You nod at the man's vehemence, if nothing else. The merchant in blue continues. If you truly wish to work for me, follow me at a discreet distance, he says as he turns to leave. I will enter a house. Wait as long as seems prudent, then knock upon the door. If you decide against it, walk away, and this conversation will have never happened. Before long, the bl bright blue of the merchant doublet disappears into the shadows of the narrow streets. If you wish to follow him and en enter his employ, you must do so now, before you lose sight of him. Huh. This is interesting. Yeah, see, the problem is, I would like to disband him, or not disband him, um dethrone him from the inside so if we could get in and then take over that'd be one thing but i don't feel like running messages i think we'll go to the swords
You make your decision quickly. You want no part of William of Hellefort's offer, nor do you want to be in anyone else's service. You will stick with your decision to mark your own path. Thankfully, the merchant's instructions prove easy enough to remember, and eventually you find yourself before a large, rambling building, half timber and two stories high. A bright painted wooden sign portraying a long sword with flames along the length of it, of its blade hangs from the, above its door. This seems to be the place. Bone tired from the day's exertions, and with the prospect of rest within reach, you find yourself with barely enough energy to stumble to the counter to get a room for the night. Exhausted, you tumble into bed, too tired to think about anything other than to sleep. Thankfully, your night is restful and un uninterrupted. The next morning, you start the first day of your life in the city of Kendrickstone. Well, hey, look at that. Not bad, not bad. When we come back, chapter four, and we'll start making our mark in the world. Later, guys.